Uh, our next speaker this afternoon is uh, Mark Bridge. Now, if I ask Mark to come down from Tree Engineers, I'll let uh, Mark take it on from there. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jonathan. Right. Good. So, um, very happy to be back here again today. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'd like to spend the next half hour talking about uh, PP Goes Global. Uh, I'd just like to position this talk a bit so you understand uh, where, where I'm coming from. This is the result of discussions that uh, Chris Cowell and myself had about um, things that we were seeing happening in, in our industry, tree care, um, quality assurance issues and things like that. And um, we spoke to the manufacturers we were associated with. We went to uh, Coil to speak with Vanderbilt Sue and Alex and Buona in the spring, and uh, other manufacturers as well, to try and get a better understanding of the issues surrounding development, manufacturing, and quality assurance of PP in an ever increasingly globalized world. So I'm not saying this is complete. I'm not saying it's without fault. I'd just like to show you where I'm at with my understanding today. I think for all of us who are involved professionally with one form of work hard to the other, um, the daily use of personal protective equi uh, equipment um, in against falls is we take for granted. But when, you, when you're involved with training, when you're working with people and starting off maybe, um, the first thing that you're explaining to them is, you know, it is safe to trust your life to that equipment. You know, you can assume that it's not going to blow apart when you load it, and you can even, you know, you can take, a, you know, you can't take a ball. Sorry, I'm off on a tangent here. No, you can't do that. Anyway, it's safe. It's safe. You can trust it. Um, so, I think we can actually quantify that a bit. I'd like to look at some of the European legislation, very briefly. Uh, look at the, very briefly, different PP classes, although you're all familiar with that, of course. Uh, briefly touch on the notified body system. Uh, <coughs> I'd like to talk about quality assurance, traceability, the globalization of production, recalls and safety issues, and just to summarize that briefly at the end. So that's the scope of what I'd like to look at. There is one very large, um, piece of legislation that um, regulates PP in the European Union. Uh, ben, I mentioned it before. It's the 89606 directive um, that has, that is a very wide-ranging directive and has a number of targets. <coughs> it applies to all person protective equipment and it lays down um, guidelines in regards to placing a PP on the market and it also defines some basic safety requirements in regards to health and safety um, requirements made. Um, I think a key word is this harmonization, that it aims to harmonize uh, the notified bodies um, system, for example, the way, these are, the way the PP is examined. And it also defines situations in which PP can be withdrawn from the market. So it's a, it's a big piece of legislation, and it, it's, it's very far reaching, actually once you start looking into it. Again, you know, we all know this, but just to repeat, um, category one, there's simple PP, which is any number of things. I think sunglasses is a, is a typical one for that. Uh, complex PP, <coughs> class three PP, that would be our protection against falls from height, that would be the area that we're operating. It's basically any PP that is used in situations where failure of the piece of equipment would lead to serious or fatal, um, uh, would have serious or fatal consequences. So, the notified bodies are a central element um, within the a central component within that directive. Um, they are, is indicated on the, on all pieces of personal protective equipment of class three, uh, the declaration of conformity of the manufacturer and the notified body number behind it. Um, and I think sometimes we tend to forget is that we tend to think that the EN standards is the be all and end all. That's the box we're trying to tick. But actually, it's the other way around. Um, the standards are just an expression of conformity 
that conformity to the um, 89606 directive is key, and not the fact that you're ticking a standards box. So it could be a say, it could be a manufacturer standard is, is exactly as much an expression of conformity as a pre-confection EN standard. And I think we tend to forget about that when discussing PP. So there you go, that would be our RC. And it's it's not that. That's not what we're looking for. Apparently that turned out which made me smile China export, so obviously that's not what we're going for. <laughs> And it has to be indicated on each piece of PP. On this carabiner, for instance, we've got the um, C logo there and the notified body SGS indicator behind it there. There's a number of ways that you can assure quality. Um, of course, you could use your ISO 9001. Um, certification to um, define processes and to monitor that processes are being uh, are being um, ad adhered to. That people are following the process you define. You could use something like New United Laboratories internally to assure that those processes are all functioning correctly. But actually, what's interesting is that again, the 89606 defines. And Bernard touched on this before in Article 11. Uh, shows two different routes you can take when um, when doing your quality assurance. There's the route A, the 11A, uh, which is used by smaller companies often, uh, where the quality control system is put in place um, by the manufacturer. And basically, um, as a manufacturer, I'm ensuring that my that my um, production is um, guarantees that quality, uh, and then it meets the direct the requirements of the directive. So that's an internal process that I'm going through, um, and it requires a yearly recertification. The other route we can take take is an LMB, which is where you've got an external monitoring, which is done by a notified body. So <coughs> that um, there, I basically. Um, delegate that quality assurance to a notified body who are taking care of that aspect of things. And the application to the notified body um, includes quite a number of things, uh, all the information relevant to the PDP that is being discussed, uh, documentation of the quality control system, um, and under the, um, how you're going to undertake to guarantee that all of those corner points you've decided to define are going to be, um, are going to be um, Guaranteed. And actually, if you look at the other set of user instructions, like here, you can see that type certification here was um, above in my state, and the um, quality control is run by a TUF in Ireland. So that's actually divided between two notified bodies, which shows that would be an example of an 11B route that pets are taken. So, traceability is another key element and another key component to that 89606. Um, the philosophy being that basically I can trace any piece of equipment from the base constituent elements um, that, the, that the material is made up from through the real raw materials, through production, to um, the dealer, to the end user, and via their uh, PP inspection sheets, for instance, if there were an incident, I could track, I could trace all the way back and say, was it uh, failure due to, um, was it the materials that was it materials fault, was it a production fault, was it uh, storage, was it um, the end user who was at fault, that should be uh, traceable and I should be able to pinpoint where something went wrong. However, I think the world. I think it's fair to say that the world we live in today is increasingly our buying habits are influenced by price, and I think um, it's a fact that that is putting manufacturers under pressure and is forcing them to adapt to consumption habits changing. People want a good deal. There's a number of ways that they do this. 
For instance, by optimizing um, or simplifying production processes, I could optimize design to, lead to use less material. Obviously, that's one way of cutting costs. I could mechanize. Forestry is a good example for that, isn't it? Or I could outsource my production. And it's pictures like this that I think uh, manufacturers shy away from. And, but I think, I think it's really important to qualify this. I'm always really um, fascinated going to, to the outdoor show in Philly South and all the ANA or wherever, where all the, actually mainly the outdoor show, I suppose, uh, where all the manufacturers are falling over each other to explain to you how ecologically sustainable their production is. Long, wordy paragraphs in their catalogues. Well, then, I think the second part of that, which is all very well, but I think the second part, to me, much more relevant or interesting part of that question is, is um, social accountability. So it could be that these people are actually working under perfectly fair conditions. <laughs> you know, they've, been, they've been given a good deal. But I think the truth of the matter is, if you outsource your production, you're doing it to lower costs or to, or to increase profit margins. And there's, two, there, there's one big area that you, that you can reduce cost in that, that is the wages that you're paying people. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's oversimplified to say that going to Far East, for instance, is per se a bad thing. Um, but I think it can be. I think you have to look at it more exactly. And I'd want, I'd want the manufacturer to explain to me why they think it's a good idea and how is it socially accountable or sustainable. So let's take an example for this globalization process. Let's take a carabiner that is designed, let's say, in Switzerland. And um, that brand it is, because not the manufacturer, um, out gives that contract to a company in Taiwan who subcontracts it to a company in Chongqing who passes that on again to a company in, Th in, in Thailand who actually produced that piece of equipment. So actually, the companies who we consider to be manufacturers often is not a brand. And they're the beginning of a long chain of subcontracting that is actually quite hard to trace. Okay, that is exactly what's happening. Subcontractors, subcontract, subcontractors, and um, it's quite hard to, to trace where that's uh, where that's all coming from going to. Manufacturers such as King Snaps, also known as Siggy King Pet, they make um, carabiners and dog leash snaps. Or Yusang Industrial, CRC Port Protection, um, and there's there's lots and lots of others. You know, you go to the you go to the shows, the specialist shows, and there's a range. There's a huge range of manufacturers. Dusan, for instance, uh, is specialised in steel components. Uh, CIC is a lot of aluminium. Yet they both have both. So obviously, there's also equipment being switched. They're, they're moving stuff amongst each other as well. CIC, for instance, that is actually quite. Some of their stuff is quite refined. So it's not necessarily. Um, just any old thing, it can look fine, um, but there are some issues there. So, take a look at these for instance, and um, some of those may look familiar, or those. Okay. And the only question I'd like to ask there is, quality assurance. Who's guaranteeing quality there? And um, it was interesting, an Australian asked last year, I picked up a couple of carabiners. So there you go. It's nice and anodized, and it cost me a whole nine Australian dollars. That's a pretty good value. And um, when I go to look at breaking strains on that, actually there's absolutely nothing indicated on it. So first, so what was interesting about this was it's the first time that I'd seen a carabiner actually being sold as a King Snaps carabiner. Until now, you, you would guess it's King Snaps, um, but it's been rebranded. And I guess, for me, the alarming development there is that until now, King Snaps have sold to a European or North American, whatever brand, had it rebranded. They do their quality control and sell it on to, to retailers. And what's happening here is that the manufacturer is going straight to the retailer, cutting out the step in between of the brand. So who's doing the quality assurance? Probably nobody. And again, we don't know. So, but on the other hand, you have to say, if there were a markup on this, you know, say if it weren't 
eight Australian dollars, say if it cost 20 euros or something, and it were branded with, uh, it were rebranded with a brand that you trust, would you question it? Looks okay to me. There's another issue there, which is quality fade. Quality fade, I think, is an inevitable part of manufacturing, which is fine. For instance, if I look at the first hitch climbers that DMM produced, um, the, the, the writing on those hitch climbers in, in the, that, that are hot forged was all crisp and clear. And if I look at the um, hitch climbers coming off the, the forge today, that writing is not quite as crisp anymore. Because of course, if you're a tool and you're in a hundred, whatever, 80 ton press and you've been whacked ever so many times, you start to get tired and there's, you know, there's just, there's just material being lost there. And it, that forging tool is not as crisp and sharp anymore, which is fine if you have a quality assurance scheme in place to catch that, catch the quality fade before it come, becomes safety relevant. If you don't have that in place, there's an issue. I used to use this slide in uh, presentations about this kind of stuff, saying PPE is inherently safe. A manufacturer who puts a piece of dangerous equipment out there, that'd be insane. The, the, the place where problems happen is in that interface between the user and the piece of equipment. That's where things go wrong. So it, that could be due to misconfiguration or overload. I love that image. It's, um, in Baal, where I live. It's on a big silo, it must be about 100 metres. This is special forces doing their training. She, this lady's got a harness on back to front with this carabiner completely nose loaded. I would be worried, okay? So that would be a classic misconfiguration there. Or, actually that's neither misconfiguration nor overload, it's just, you know, that wasn't inspected properly. But you know, that's, that's how equipment fails. I have to say, I'm not quite so sure, you know, I think generally that statement still holds true, um, but I'm not 100% sure about that statement anymore. I think we have seen some cases where that's just not the case. Let's talk about a couple of recall issues that we've seen in the last couple of years. <clears throat> this was one that I thought was striking, issued by US Rigging. And if, if you look at that, it concerns this swivel carabiner. Okay. Swivel carabiners, you put a bolt up the middle, you drill it, you put a pin in there, uh, or it's glued in place and then it's riveted. So a batch went out of the factory without that riveting, which obviously if you've got a screwed element in the bottom on a swivel beaner, that's going to be a bit of an issue. Um, but the interesting thing is that that carabiner, we saw a couple of slides back, right? So obviously they buy it from somebody else and have it rebranded. Well, what about everybody else who bought those swivel carabiners? I didn't see any other recourse from another sorry, brand. So what is it? Did US Rigan get all the dumb ones? Or is somebody not being entirely open? It's not a conspiracy theory. I'm just saying that not everybody is quite as open about these issues as or some, some people more open about it than others. There was, this is tree care specific. Um, it was, um, <coughs> Yesterday, I was waxing lyrical about rings. I think rings are safe, they're a great thing to use, uniform breaking strain, all of that. Well, we had rings fail, which is really worrying. They were, we know, two cases in, in the state, in the US, two in Germany, where the ring just blew apart at something like body weight, maybe 100, 100 kgs, nothing extraordinary. Uh, they were unmarked, polished silver rings. Um, straight away, um, Cheryl issued this warning. Uh, and straight away they said, oh, by the way, those are Kong rings. Kong, confusing, interesting enough, I suppose, offered the injured climber, one of the injured climbers in the US, money. He wanted more, and they said, well, actually, do you know what? That wasn't our ring. Um, so it went back and forwards. Cheryl goes, yes, it was your ring. Kong says, no, it wasn't our ring. And um, anyway, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of it, but um, there is a third party in there, which is US rigging, who's the importer of Kong into the US. So my, personally, my, my suspicion is, is that US uh, rigging bought rings in bulk in China and those batches got mixed up somehow and ended up in the Cheryl warehouse. 
be that as it may, the consequence of it is, was that people got hurt. Traceability was out the window. And that's crazy, isn't it? You know, you're trusting your life to, to pieces of equipment being safe, and they fail in that way, and nobody can be held accountable. Or even worse than not being held accountable is we can't even define what the problem was to prevent it from happening again. There may be more of those rings out there, we just don't know. What's striking, this was some testing that was done on other rings from US rigging, was that the grain wasn't homogenous, so it was probably some problem in the, the coal forging, cracks from the coal forging, or from the needing, or something. Something went wrong, anyway, in the manufacturing. They were definitely breaking much lower than they should have. Having said that, I spoke to another European um, manufacturer who makes harnesses. Um, I said, you know, what was their consequence out of that ring debacle? And, uh, one of the reps of that company said, well, they, they tested their rings straight away and they realized that the rings were failing much lower than they should have been, according to the um, type testing that had been done initially. And it turned out when they asked the person they were buying the rings from, that he had switched the grade of aluminium without informing them. So in all fairness, you know, it can be hard. It can be hard to tell um, where, you know, is that still identical? That this aluminium ring and this aluminium ring? I suppose that's what we have um, notified bodies for in our 11B or our quality assurance scheme if we're 11A. It makes you realize what, how, if, why Airbus took so long, long to finish their A380 when we struggle with harnesses. <laughs> the mind boggles. Uh, so this is what a recall notice could look like. Uh, this regards um, a uh, range of carabiners from that camp, 15,000 15, units, uh, they're quite large numbers. And I think that typically, if I outsource my manufacturing by order from China, that's the kind of orders I'll be, I'll be placing, because otherwise it's not worth going to, going to someone like China. Uh, and it talks about the risk of the gate, um, the, the whole thing blown apart, the, uh, the gate being pulled open. But then there's also like the counterfeit gear business that um, Petzl were hit with, where I think that's another case, to get, that's a different case again, where that's just plain and straightforward, um, a high degree of criminal energy that was involved there. Petzl's position is, well, you know, we've always been copied, but what's new here, or what's new with this case, was not only was it core elements of the Petzl range, but also that they were copies that were identical with the original. You could not tell the difference. It was also, I think for us end users, it was, somewhat, it was a somewhat ambiguous statement on how to handle this. Well, you know, don't buy a Petzl kit off the back of a truck. Go to a dealer who has the full range, which I can understand, but yet there is a degree of fuzziness there, which is, which is understandable in the end. So, and again, you know, that made me remember that camp warning from Ford. You know, it looks, it looks okay, but actually the material that's being used doesn't um, fulfill the requirements made, or doesn't fulfill uh, what it should be fulfilling. Then I went into this before already, the uh, Scorpio Absorbica business, um, and I thought actually that that move, moving away from holding stitching through to load bearing stitching only, the bar tack straight away, to me, actually, these recalls, 2011, if anything, have reinforced um, my opinion of Petzl as a benchmark uh, in manufacturing, the manufacturing world. I think the way they behave has been open and clear throughout, so I think that's really to their credit. But, you know, isn't it incredible that they had such a bad year and everybody else had no issues? Well, the truth is, that's not what was happening, was it? Is that everybody's battling these issues. Actually, if you read the specialist press, there's recall, and there's recall after recall out there. To me, actually, the, the, bad, the bad consequence of this development is not cheap gear, you know, $8 carabiners. That's not a bad thing. I think the, the serious thing is that it's creating a lot of, it's putting a lot of pressure on manufacturers to go to market with their kit a little bit earlier than they would have earlier. Well, you can take your time, really thrash it out, get your proof batching, proof batch through, and just really thrash out any problems there are. And I think what we're seeing today, people are going to market a little bit faster than they would have been a couple of years ago. And I think that's that's the serious consequence of this for us as end users. The, 
And no, actually going back, sorry. Um, so that would have been, I think we could classify that as a, as a process failure, okay? Absorbing her there was something that w went wrong in the process. What Bernard was talking about before with their platinum um, quality assurance is, is addressing the procedural uh, issue that they've identified. Uh, the, the Green Green 2 or something like uh, the Dragon Cam um, business that DMN were confronted with last year, um, that is design issues. It's design flaws that became apparent, or well, I think flaws may be a bit harsh, but design issues anyway, that uh, became apparent once something had gone into production, you recall it, that's something else again. I actually smile when I saw this one. Um, Euro 2012 um, football championship in the Ukraine and Poland. Uh, the Polish government put out a contract uh, for to renew the A1, A2, A4 uh, and the Berlin Warsaw motorway. Um, the contract was won by Kobe, which is a Chinese overseas engineering corporation. They underbid all the Polish contractors by 60%. Well, hey, it's a, it's a bargain, isn't it? Yeah. So they got the contract. Um, half a year before the European Championships, all construction stopped because they had no more money to pay the Polish subcontractors. So if you went to the football championships last summer and the roads were quite bumpy, that was the reason, the Polish government got a bit grumpy about it and they decided to sue Kobe for 180 billion euros. <laughs> well, hold on. You do have to ask, you know, did, did you not wonder? 60% difference? <laughs> you know, how could that happen? I think that's absolutely crazy. <clears throat> to me, and there, there is a parallel there to what we're discussing here. You have to question, you know, a five euro carabiner. How can you assume that it's the same thing as something that comes from a reputable manufacturer with user instructions, with certification? How can you assume that that's the same thing? <coughs> and I think really markets are different there. I think if I look at the 3K market, people are prepared to and spend, um, this is generalizing, but I think people tend to spend more money on equipment. There's other areas, it's my impression, I may be wrong, but industrial road access, I think, tends to be more of a price-based market, for instance. So, to me, that is, that is a big question, a big question mark, um, you know, coming from here. This is another one that tickled me, uh, was um, these Apple stores in Xiangping in China. Um, where you know they looked like Apple stores, they had all the products, and the the, the, the interior was was looked like Apple. Uh, the employees were wearing the right clothing, the name tags, and they thought they were working for Apple. Fact was though, the whole thing was a forgery from A to Z. It had nothing to do with Apple. <laughs> so, <laughs> sadly, not for all forgeries is it as easy as that to spot. You just don't know. Sometimes you don't know. Okay, if somebody wants to pull all your eyes, they will. So, yeah, what's the summary of all that? Well, looking at this ad here, this manufacturer says that they individually uh, strength test. Well, what's that going to do? Uh, what they're doing is they're proof loading. They're not destructive testing, otherwise they'd be destroying all the carabiners before they go out of the factory. They're, they're proof loading to a certain, you know, whatever, 8, 10, something. What does that tell us? Not a crazy amount. You could still have irregularities and not pick up on them. I would say, I would suggest that if you're manufacturing in-house and you have a robust quality assurance um, scheme in place, you can, you can batch test. You, you know, if you're sure about the, how you're producing, I, I think you could take that route. However, if you're buying components from outside and bringing them into the factory, if you're using subcontractors, probably you will want to individually test each element as it comes in. And again, I'm generalizing here, and, but I think there's, that's two routes that you can take there, conceivably. I think finally, what's important is that when we're selecting PPE, is to try and develop objective criteria and to use facts um, uh, to be the determining factor, to, to, to determine <coughs> factor to talk to other end users, to talk to manufacturers, to talk to dealer, uh, and not cut corners. I think it's the wrong place um, to cut corners on price. Um, and I think if we bear that in mind, um, hopefully we can, uh, we can change this. Because 
It would be so easy to do this presentation and go, yes, the Chinese, they, they are rotten, aren't they? When actually, that's not what it's about. It's about us. It's about our lifestyle. It's about what we demand in the way of product. And if we demand quality, we get quality. If we demand for, if we demand five, dollar, five euro carabiners, it's exactly what we get. Okay? So I just ask you to bear that in mind next time you're standing in front of a rack of shiny bling in your climbing store. And we thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.